to start with, for what happened with me in my, my journey, uh, remember this is us learning these things, but also being shared through the journey that I went through. So our final step, we're on the home stretch, but our final thing to look at is, is the Bible true? So is, is the Bible true? How do we know the Bible can be true and trusted? Now what I want to share in this week and next week, and we'll be done with this, is let's just remind ourselves, we're Christians here, we know this, but I, I don't want it to go without saying let's remind ourselves what the Bible is, why it's important, but then I want to share with you how did we get our Bible, the Bible that we have today. And the meat of this, though, is how can we trust that Bible? How do we know it's true? And also another question is do we have the right books in that Bible? The Catholics, for example, have extra books. You'll hear people say the Catholic Bible or the Protestant Bible. We follow the Protestant Bible. So that causes questions. You know, well, why don't we have their books? But we're going to hold that for next week. So I want to let you know now we're going to hold that for next week. Tonight I want to set up, we need to, in my opinion, we need to look at some introductory things before we can talk about that stuff or it gets a little, a little too crazy. So here's some questions to think about. This is questions I had when I was in college. But have you ever wondered, well, how did we even get the Bible in the first place? I took it for granted. And then I get off into college and I got questioned about the validity of it and it hit me. I don't even really know where this thing came from. I mean, I know, I knew the theology behind it. You know, God inspired it through the Holy Spirit, through Paul, and but, but the actual logistics from the apostles to us, what happened A to Z, there's a lot that happened. But then maybe we've questioned if we have all the right books in the Bible, why is the Bible such a big deal for Christians in the first place? So these are some things we're going we're gonna to answer. So step back to then my journey. So here was the final part of my journey I've been sharing with you from the beginning. At this point in my journey in college, I believed I had one more step to take in my mind. I became convinced and sure that, yes, God exists, based on all the stuff we talked about weeks ago. The scientific and philosophical evidence was overwhelming to me. To me, you could no longer deny God does exist. And then the next step, what about Jesus? Once again, the historical evidence to me was overwhelming that he was real, he was crucified, the tomb was found empty three days later, but that given the eyewitness testimonies, all the historical data, the only true explanation was he rose again from the dead, as he said. So I wasn't doubting God or Jesus. I, wasn't, I never doubted my salvation, as I told you. I just needed my mind to grapple, though, with, but how do I know this stuff is real? So but the final question would be, but how can we truly know God? If you say God is there, but how do you really know him? It, Jesus, but how do you know how to follow Jesus, too, if you're supposed to live for him? Well, we would answer as Christians, well, that's where the Bible comes in. The Bible is our guidebook, our rule book. It's our source to hear from God. But that begged that final question for me. If the Bible is so important, though, but how can I know it's true as well? Because other religious groups have their own Bible. The Muslims have the Quran, right? The uh, Mormons, uh, Mormons will, unless they've changed their doctrine, it used to be when I talked to Mormons, that they accepted the King James Version of the Bible, but only that one. They thought all the others have been corrupted, but they accepted equally the Book of Mormon. So the point being, you've got different religions that have their Bible. What makes the Bible different? Our Bible different than the others. So that's what I wanted to look at. Here's some objections I was hearing from professors and people that that, that were making me think. Well, one would be, well, you don't have the originals. You don't have the original letters Paul wrote or Peter wrote, so you can't trust it. Now I want to I want to share with you guys something here. This I've talked about this before in other places, not in this church. This fact right here sometimes shocks people. And I'm not calling you out. I don't want to embarrass anybody, but, but, so I'm not asking you to raise your hand. But did you know we don't have the originals? They are long gone. We don't have the original letter that Paul wrote to the Romans. We don't, they're gone. They have been gone from history. But what I want to work you through in this process is that should not be a problem for us because of how they handled the Word of God back then. 
But I, but I did want to be straight up with you that though you can't go to a museum of the Bible somewhere and say, look, Paul wrote this. It doesn't exist. Long gone. We have copies of that. And I want you to keep holding these thoughts because we'll get into this because that could present problems like it did me. Because as soon as I found this out, I thought, well, how do I know? How do I know then? If, if what Paul wrote to the Romans is lost, how do I know what he wrote? You actually can know, but I didn't know it at the time. What happens is there's copies. Well, that begged a second objection I was told. Well, but when you copy things, what can happen? You make mistakes. So the copies are going to have mistakes, so that means your Bible is going to have mistakes. I was told, well, you really don't know what the original letters said, so you can't trust the Bible you have today. You can't know also that you have the right books that are supposed to be in there. This was a big one that I had to research because it did, it threw me off. But one professor said, if you read church history, it was church councils where the church would come together and have big councils. They, they argued it was the church councils that declared this is the Bible and these are the books that are going to be in it. So the argument given to me was your Bible's man-made all throughout. It's no different than any other book because men wrote it. The original copies they wrote are long gone, so you can't trust that the copies that were made are accurate. And then on top of that, there was a hundred books. I'm being simplistic. Let's say there's a hundred books claiming to be a, a word from God, but yet the church only said, well, these 66 fit the bill. So the conclusion they make is that the Bible is just a man-made book. You can't, you know, <laughs> you can't trust it. Now, to be honest with you, that's a, that's a lot. And I, I would dare say that most church people have probably not been presented that material. And I think that's a, a bad thing because then when kids get off to college or they start hearing this stuff, that can really rattle your cage. Like, say, so you mean to tell me we don't have the originals? You mean to tell me that the church decided the books? Well, there's a lot more to it than that, and that's what we're going to look at. So I, I want you to have hope. There's a lot more to it. But at the start, I do want to be upfront with you that these are the realities I was presented with. Well, what is the Bible? Why is it important? Um, think of it like this. We all know what the Bible is as Christians, but let's summarize this and we'll move on. God exists. He created humans to know Him, be in a relationship with Him. But what happened to humanity in Genesis 3? We sinned. And from that point on, Genesis 3 on, God cannot be in this open, perfect, harmonious relationship anymore with humanity. Because he's perfect, righteous, and holy, he cannot be in the presence of sin like that. So God, however, still chooses to want to save people, but uh, he can't have this sort of open dialogue all the time, like before Genesis 3. So in comes the Bible. God chose special messengers to convey a message, a specific message, often at times to specific people in a specific place, and they would present that to that audience. So you have the prophets in the Old Testament. They're giving a message from God, and they would say, you know, thus says the Lord, and they give a message from God. In the New Testament, the same way, you have Paul saying, hey, this is a message I have to the Romans, per the Lord, the Holy Spirit conveying that message to him, and he gives that, that message down. So God left us his written word so we could always go back and hear from him. Because think if we didn't have the written word. Well, you would, you would hope God still calls prophets today because then you would need to go hear that prophet or else you can't hear from God. So it's, a, it's an act of mercy that God gave us his written word because we can always go back and hear what God has to say. Um, it's our manual for living the Christian life. But what is the Bible? Uh, I'm being real general right now. So it's a collection of 66 books in total that tell one big story, though. It's 66 different books, but it's really one big book, one story. Uh, you could describe it many different ways. This is just how I describe it. I like to think of the Bible as it's really one big story about God's kingdom. God created a kingdom. Humanity rebelled. His, his people rebelled against his kingdom reign. But God still has his kingdom, but from the rest of that story, he's, he's calling people back into his kingdom that he'll one day bring physically on earth again, book of Revelation. But until we get to that book of Revelation, the in-between is he's calling people into his kingdom. 
the uh, Lord of the kingdom, if you will, is Jesus Christ. And so that's how people are called into the kingdom. So before Jesus in the Old Testament, God interacted with the world through Israel. That's why they're important. Now after the cross, he interacts in the world today. Can you guess how? Through you guys, us, the church. Paul says the church is the pillar and support of God's truth in the world. So, But it's all about the kingdom, because if you read the book Revelation, it, it's, there's a new kingdom to come. God's going to institute a kingdom reign. So God chose these certain authors to convey his special message that he wanted recorded down. The Bible then is a type of a special witness. It's a special testimony that God gave about himself, sort of, about, about life, us, and everything. Uh, theologians will use the term, if you read a theological book, you'll, you'll see them refer to the Bible as special revelation. Revelation meaning God gave, he revealed his knowledge, he, he revealed himself to us in a special way. The reason they call it that way is they'll use another term called general revelation. When they say general revelation, they're talking about nature, science, all that other stuff we've talked about. God reveals himself through science, through order, through trees and through humanity and through love so you can see God's fingerprints through all of that but you don't learn details about God for example you don't learn that God exists as a trinity just by looking in nature you get what I'm saying you can have an awareness that he's there and you can have an awareness of how awesome he is but you have to go to special revelation the Bible to learn the details who God really is what what he's like so again, I told you 66 different books written about over 1,600 years of time, more than 40 different writers. Some were kings, prophets, leaders, disciples of Jesus. The Old Testament with 39 books and the New Testament with 27. But I want to stress to you, one of the proofs to me for the Bible is it is consistent all throughout. It's really one big narrative if you were to put all the books together and read them as one story. Now why is it important because without it, we could not know the specific will and plans of God. If you look at Psalm 19, we won't read it, but I challenge you sometime to read Psalm chapter 19. The first six verses are what I said some theologians call general revelation. Uh, the psalm starts out with, The heavens declare the glory of God. So that's this idea that God made everything, and it's as if he left his mark on it. And so we can look at what he made and say, this is awesome, someone put this here. So the heavens are sort of telling us about God's awesomeness. And he goes on in those uh, first six verses to talk about the wonders in nature and how the sun, it, it sort of gives this message of God's creative wonders and his power. But then when you uh, read the rest of the chapter, 7 through 14, it moves to what would be called special revelation. He then shifts in verse 7 to say, the law of the Lord is perfect. Well, the law meaning for his day, the law of Moses, the word of God. So there's this idea then that, yes, look to God through nature, but you need to look to the word to get the specific stuff about God. So tonight, this is what I want to share with you guys, and we'll get to the, the tough stuff a little bit more next week. So try to come back next week. But we can't really talk about the tough stuff until we kind of see what happened though how did we get the bible if if we can learn how we got the bible in the first place that is really going to help us to look at well what's the evidence though to support it's true now it started with god god authored it through chosen men uh, the first verse i have is second timothy 3:16 now in second timothy 3:16 paul wrote this and says all scripture is most translations say all scripture is inspired by God. I don't like the word inspired for our day because if someone said to me, I was inspired to write this, I'm thinking poetry. Like, like they, they saw a sunset and it moved them to, to write a song about the sunset or a, a songwriter, you know, they were inspired because of a, a loss or a love. That is not what Paul meant by inspired. In fact, the Greek that it was written in is, some believe, a made-up word. It's as if Paul smashed two words together. He used one word for God, and he used another word for exhaling air. So he put the two words together, and it literally would read, all scripture is God breathed out, or God breathed. In fact, um, I brought 
an English Standard Version. I don't know what translation of the Bible you like to read, but if you look at an ESV, it says in this version, all scripture is breathed out by God. So just to point out to you that not every English translation says inspired because they're they're very much aware that inspired is okay, but that can also convey a wrong idea. It, it literally means this, it's breathed out by God. Paul is saying it's as if God exhaled air and then here comes the Bible. But some stuff had to happen though. Like what happened from God breathing that out and we got a copy of the Bible? Second uh, Peter 1.20, he kind of tells us the process. Peter says this, Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. So meaning, prophets didn't just make this stuff up. It came from somewhere. They got their prophecy from someone somewhere else. Verse 21, he says, For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So Peter answers the question for us. Paul says Scripture is uh, God-breathed, but how did, how did Scripture get from God breathing it out to the people? He chose prophets, he chose special messengers, and these special messengers then were carried along, he says, by the Holy Spirit, moved along by the Holy Spirit. The wording in Greek conveys like a ship with a sail and the wind is pushing the sail. So the point being, a prophet didn't just make this up on their own. God moved on them. How did he move on them? Through the Holy Spirit. And through the Holy Spirit gave them that message of what they need to say to the people. So that's how God, Paul could say, he breathed out his word. How? Through chosen messengers. And then Peter says those chosen messengers, it was through the work of the Holy Spirit. So that's how God got his message out. Then their message was recorded down. The prophets were recorded down in the Old Testament, the apostles in the New Testament. Well, now that begs our next logical question. Okay, so how did they record it down? How, and then, when they recorded it down, how was it preserved? Okay, let's look at that. One thing we need to recall from history is... The printing press was not invented until around the year 1450. Does anyone know what the printing press was? A, sort of an ancient first generation of a printer. So before then, they published books, but it was a very painstaking process. How do you think books were published back then before the printing press? By hand. Um, someone would, with a quill and ink, right on animal skin if you were rich, uh, parchment from plants if you weren't as rich, but they were pressed out. I have some pictures in a moment, but so they wrote on scrolls. Sometimes they could bind them. They could take the papers and make like a book, what we th would think of as a book, but that was a handwritten copy or a handwritten original, sorry. Then if they wanted to publish that, there were people that their professional job were copyists. And that was their job because that big market for that, there wasn't printers, there wasn't computers, there wasn't click and print and I want 20 copies, none of that, okay? So you're, you would have people that you would pay to copy your book and you would go distribute it out. But again, you had to be somewhat wealthy to be able to publish books like that. You would at times need to have some money to even copy a book, especially if you wanted it copied on expensive animal skin. So... They would copy things by hand, though, before about the year 1450. So that means back then in the Bible world, everything was copied around by hand. It was written down on papyrus or parchment. The papyrus was made from papyrus leaves, and the parchment was considered a type of high grade made from animal skins. I, I keep wanting to stress to you, uh, because I remember thinking at first, yeah, like, why don't we have more copies of these things from back in the day originally? It was expensive. It was not, they were not how we are today. It was a much different process. These are papyrus leaves. You would take these, you would dry them out, and you would stretch them out, and you have your scrolls. Another version would be animal skins, and they would take that, and you would literally quill with ink, write your stuff on it, okay? 
So how did the Old Testament work? God gave his message to a chosen messenger or a prophet. They recorded it down. The Hebrews then had a special type of people called scribes. Now, the scribes show up in Jesus' day. When you read the Gospels, you'll see the scribes maybe debating with him. The scribes could somewhat be considered like attorneys because they had to be experts in the law. But they were experts in the law because one of their main duties were to oversee the copying and the preservation of the Old Testament. And that's a big job. It's God's Word, and you're tasked with making sure it's copied precisely perfect when you need a new copy of Isaiah, for example. It's a big job. So you're going to know it front and back. You're going to copy it very meticulously. Um, Now... When copies would, let's say Moses writes uh, the Torah, the first five books. He has the original version that God gave him, and he copied it down. Well, over time, what's going to happen to that copy? What do you think? It, it's going to destroy. I mean, you've left a book probably on a dashboard, right? Even a modern book. What does the sun do to it if you just leave it there? It's going to like wilt up. It's going to fade. Well, imagine back then, before modern printing methods. So... It, it happens. The, the original Moses wrote is just going to get destroyed one day. So that means then the Hebrews said, okay, well, we have to have special people. They call them the scribes. That's their job. They're going to take what Moses has, and their job is to precisely and perfectly keep copies going. So we always have what Moses originally gave handed down every generation. I want to share with you one scribal tradition called the Masoretic Tradition to give you an example of how meticulous this process was. They would wear Jewish ceremonial clothing before they started the copying process. So he's going to, the scribe's going to go to this room designated to copy. So he has the scroll of Isaiah, for example. The, the one he's going to copy is, you know, here, and he's sitting down here with a fresh scroll, his pen and ink. He's wearing special clothes. They would um, even ceremonially wash, go through like a ritual process. All right, now then, as far as the rules, um, if, if he came to writing the name of God, what we pronounce Yahweh, he could not use a quill with new ink, because what can happen if you were to write with like a fountain pen freshly put in? What's going to happen when you start to write? Yeah, it's going to, all that ink is starting to come out. So they had special rules even for that. Like when you're writing the name of God, you can't, you can't have new ink because it's going to smear and run off. Um, other rules they had, the scroll was written on a clean animal skin, It couldn't, meaning it, it had to be brand new, it couldn't be recycled, it couldn't be uh, like a leftover from another book, it was fresh new. Then each skin could contain, had to contain a specified number of columns that was equal throughout the entire book. Each column's length could be no less than 48 lines and no more than 60 lines. The column's breadth had to be exactly 30 letters across. So 30 letters across, he had to stop and go to a new line. He couldn't have less than 48 lines down, no more than 60. The point was they were trying to be meticulous with how that's copied. So when the next guy copies, he can follow that flow. Thank you for watching. We hope this has been helpful to you. If it has, please consider liking and sharing the video and subscribing to the channel. Join us next time as we'll begin to examine more about how it is we have our Bible of today.